Thank you. And uh, I'm not a professional researcher. I'm a hobbyist researcher, so I want to extend particularly uh, great appreciation to this community, to you, and to the Ancestral Health, health um, Symposium to listen to me today. Unfortunately, I deeply fell in love with this topic, and so I'm going to have to uh, speak really fast and maybe even run into the question time a little bit, but I hope it'll still be comprehensible. I think this is the thing. Or maybe just this. Okay, so if you've heard about uric acid at all, it's probably in the context of gout because gout is associated with high uric acid. Uh, the thing is, not everyone who has high uric acid gets gout. In fact, only a small proportion of them do. And it's even the case that out of everyone who has gout, only uh, there's a significant minority that don't even have high uric acid. Um, nonetheless, we don't really know very much detail about why it sometimes crystallizes and why, it, why in other people it doesn't. However, I'm told it's absolutely excruciating. I've seen it negatively compared to childbirth, and it is associated with high uric acid levels, and so I don't blame you for trying to avoid them. But another reason that uric acid gets a bad rap is because it's been associated with metabolic syndrome. In this review, for example, we have many studies that are making such an association, and a handful of them actually have a relative risk of over two, so it may potentially be serious. I think high uric acid is a very good candidate for a mismatch argument because, as I will show you, high uric acid seems to be highly selected for in humans, and yet it's associated with these problems. So it's possible even that if, if we were somehow in a situation where gout and metabolic syndrome were not a real risk, that there could actually still be an advantage to higher levels. So in order to get clearer on this, I'm going to talk about some biochemistry, some physiology, some evolutionary biology, and some cross-species analysis. Like with anything in the blood, your level is always going to be a consequence of how much is being produced and how much is being used or excreted. So from the production side, uric acid is always made out of purines. Purines are just a class of molecules that happen to be particularly important to life because a couple of our nucleotides are actually based on it. Um, in addition to that, adenosine is made out of adenine, and so anything that involves ATP or purinergic signaling in the brain is also uh, involved with purines. So that means that everything that's living has purines in it, and if you're gonna eat something that's, if you're gonna eat animal foods or particularly organ foods or seafood, you're going to get a lot of incoming purines that are then metabolically broken down, and that is one contributor to levels of uric acid in the blood. But then, of course, we're also made of meat, so we're constantly producing our own purines, and sometimes they get recycled and sometimes they don't. So endogenous synthesis and um, metabolizing of purines is actually where most of our blood uric acid comes from. Then if you get some kind of tissue damage that can also be incorporated into blood because any time that a tissue breaks down that floods the system so people who have chemo or some kind of uh, big injury will sometimes get dangerously high levels of uric acid. You might think that then of all people vegans would have the lowest levels of uric acid. But at least in this study, that didn't turn out to be the case. Vegans in this study had the highest levels of uric acid, even higher than the meat eaters. They didn't come up with this idea, but I speculate that the reason for this is that a chronic deficiency in essential proteins is going to require that you break down some of your own muscle tissue to make up for that deficit. Okay, so what about the excretion side? Here's a cartoon of uric acid passing through the kidneys, and there are pathways for secreting it and for reabsorbing it. There are different polymorphisms involved in the transport, and the majority of people who have problems with hyperuricemia have polymorphisms in the excretion side. But even not taking those into account, 90% uh, or more of the uric acid that comes into your kidneys gets reabsorbed. And at risk of sounding like I'm anthropomorphizing, that seems quite intentional. So just to summarize, 
uh, the different ways that serum uric acid is a combination of is you've got dietary purine intake, you've got your own endogenous synthesis. I've circled fructose, and I'm going to come back to that. Then you have how much you're salvaging versus not, and then on the other side you have how much you're excreting versus absorbing. Okay, so the other thing that seems really intentional from a species point of view is that most animals and other animals, uh, other mammals, have uricase, which regulates their level of uric acid by breaking it down into a much uh, more soluble compound, elantuin, before excreting it. And so that reduces the risks that are associated with having high uric acid. Um, we lost this ability a long time ago with a series of mutations starting over 20 million years ago in the primate line. So this lack of uricase we share with other great apes. Here is a diagram of splits related to uricase. And um, the, the changes are all changes in the protein of the uricase function. And the pink numbers are just showing how much uric acid can be broken down. So the one that I've circled, you can see that's the first major change in how much uric acid we're able to break down, and that's at the primate level. But then from there on, it just gets lower and lower and lower. And when you get up to that right-hand side, you start seeing these genes that are actually stopping the function completely. And one thing that's really interesting to notice about that is that it happens in independently in different lines, and, the, and there are redundancies of it. It's, it's not just one thing that you could maybe say is accidental. And at the same time as all that was happening, on the excretion side, we also have the urate 1 transporter, which is in charge of uh, how much absorption can happen. And I've circled the words high affinity and low capacity. High affinity means that it takes only a very small amount of uric acid to be present to get that reabsorption happening. And low capacity means it gets saturated really quickly. So once you get to a certain level, it doesn't absorb anymore. And the total of those ideas is that you've got a really tightly regulated system. And then I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are differences even between the human and chimpanzee level, which may be really important because um, among all the primates, we have the highest uric acid level. So if you look at primates, all of the ones under that uricase mutation line don't have functional uricase, but there are still differences in our base levels. So there has to be more to it than just that. So all of these factors combined, um, make it highly probable that high uric acid in humans is not an accident. First of all, it's species-wide, right? So if you, if you think about a loss of function gene, and it's just because we don't really need it, you would expect to see different polymorphisms surviving because there's no particular advantage to having it or not having it. That's not what happened here. Uh, there are independent lines of it. It's happened in multiple cases with redundancy. And then, of course, that reabsorption, which in the words of Tavchiga and Striegel, would be very strange for an indifferent substance. And finally, the level that we've ended up with is really close to the solubility limit. It's about as high as you can go before it, it's just going to go into crystals no matter what you do. Since uric acid is a breakdown product, it's tempting to think of it as just a waste product like other waste products. Um, the reason to exist is just so that it can be excreted. And I, I bring this up because I'm reminded of older literature about ketone bodies where they talk about it as a, a byproduct of fat metabolism and how it can be toxic when it's accumulated. But uric acid is actually used for something. So <laughs> it's an antioxidant. There are a few different pathways that in certain cases can actually be really important. Some people argue that it's the most important antioxidant that we have. Of course, they're all important, so <laughs> it's a funny argument. But it's been shown to be more powerful than vitamin C, that it, it's in some ways of measuring it more than half of our antioxidant activity. It can chelate iron. It's really important for exercise-induced oxidation. It prevents lipid peroxidation. And that leads us to the earliest hypothesis about uricase, which is the antioxidant longevity hypothesis. So it was first mentioned by Proctor and then popularized and expanded upon by Bruce Ames. And the idea is that when you look at across species, the ones who have the highest level of uh, uric acid also have the highest longevity. And of course, we, we have an idea that oxidative stress and longevity are somehow related. 
But it turns out experimentally that if you just boost antioxidants, it doesn't necessarily translate into longer lifespans. And uh, people have pointed out that within the human species, high uric acid is not necessarily correlated to longer lifespan, especially when you take into account that metabolic syndrome effect. Another component of the antioxidant theory is to notice that, in the words of Rick Johnson, we are double knockouts. So another 20 or 30 million years before the uricase stuff started happening, we lost our ability to synthesize vitamin C. Why did that happen? Well, some people have suggested, again, that we just didn't need it, and of course, that would be more compelling if various polymorphisms existed, which they don't. Um, there are multiple stop genes for this as well. Um, another suggested advantage is that when you create an antioxidant endogenously, it actually creates oxidation, and so the net oxidation advantage is maybe a wash, and therefore the idea is that if you're going to get all of your vitamin C exogenously, that's a win over endogenously because you don't get that oxidation step first. But I don't find that very compelling either because you could keep the ability to synthesize it when you need it and only bring it into play when you don't get it. The more compelling idea that I've heard about it is that it actually spares glucose. And sparing glucose, especially for a large-brained animal, could be really important. Uh, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, is made out of glucose, so that's one potential reason. But regardless of why we have the vitamin C knockout, once we have that, we can build on that and say, well, now the motivation for, or the advantage to having high uric acid is that it actually improves the ability to use vitamin C. It itself is a, an antioxidant. And so between the two, we get more antioxidant capacity given that we started from this low vitamin C state. And if you look at the proportions, in humans, uric acid to vitamin C, we have about four times as much uric acid as vitamin C, whereas those who are synthesizing it have only about a third the level of uric acid and some three to four times higher the ascorbic acid. So this idea that one's taking over the function of the other is kind of compelling. And so the whole idea behind Bruce Ames' theory is that basically uric acid is a compensation for that previous mutation. Another important hypothesis is the intelligence hypothesis. It, it was noticed that prominent intelligent people tended to have high uric acid um, and the association was kind of weak. People started looking into it a lot. And after more study, they, they decided that it was actually mo higher motivation and not intelligence per se. So people who were really prominent in their field, who had a lot of influence, tended to have high uric acid. But high intelligence wasn't enough. You had to also have this um, motivation to use it. And it, it, there's sort of a comparison to cortisol. And then, of course, it was noticed uh, another supporting factor for this hypothesis is that caffeine and theobromine are, are purines and have stimulant effects on the brain. And so the idea is maybe high uric acid is doing that for us as well. This is connected to the neuroprotection hypothesis. There's long been noticed that in many neurodegenerative diseases, there's an association at least with low uric acid and some preliminary evidence that, in some cases, at least adding uric acid or its precursor inosine can um, improve outcomes. But I think the jury is still out on whether that's actually the case. There is a blood pressure hypothesis. So contrary to what you may have heard, uh, in all likelihood, we probably didn't have very high sodium intakes during uh, most of our evolution. And uh, Watanabe and their group showed that in the context of a low-salt diet, high uric acid can be really important for maintaining blood pressure, which could have an important role in the transition to bipedalism. But by far the most important and prevalent theory about why we don't have uricase is what I'm calling the thrifty pseudogene hypothesis. A pseudogene is a turned-off gene. It comes from... Uh, Dr. Richard Johnson, who is by far the most prominent researcher, the most worldwide expert in uric acid, he's obviously very prolific. Uh, so before we can understand the 
pseudo-gene hypothesis, let's talk a little bit about the thrifty gene hypothesis. Uh, forgive me, I spelled uh, James Neal's name wrong. It should be two E's, but he came up with this theory in the 60s. Um, and it goes basically like this. So in the past, we had a lot of famines. Uh, so it was advantageous to fatten easily so that we could then survive and reproduce during these famines. And so we probably had a gene that's making us more likely to fatten. Uh, and now, of course, uh, that's a problem because we don't have those famines anymore, and so that's the origin of our obesity crisis. There have been a lot of criticisms levied against this theory, most prominently by John Speakman, but others as well. Uh, I'll go through a couple of them that relate to this talk. So one is, uh, this, and this one's kind of weak, but there is some question about whether uh, how much selective pressure famines really uh, had, and whether uh, some people argue that famines didn't really become a huge problem until after agriculture. But it's a question. Uh, but more important is this uh, survival idea, because in famines, the pe people die of disease, not starvation. And so it's unclear that having extra fat would help. And moreover, there are problems with the reproduction idea. Uh, for example, famines tend to affect the very young and the very old, not the reproducers. And fertility rates seem to be affected by the incoming signals of fuel availability, and it's not clear that just having more fat is going to differentiate there. And then an another related criticism is that uh, if you look at famines recently, birth rates do fall, but then they're immediately followed by compensating booms, and there's no evidence to suggest that it's the fatter people who are creating the fertility booms. Um, there's a problem about finding an actual gene that would do this. And then finally, I just want to mention that um, we've had some long periods between famines in the recent past, and we didn't see anything like the rates of obesity that we have now. So if, if that was going to happen, why didn't it happen then? And other questions <laughs> uh, could probably be a whole talk. So when I first saw this paper from Rick Johnson and his group that was talking about the uh, uricase being the thrifty gene or the thrifty pseudo gene, I was Im immediately very skeptical, but it turns out that there are some really good improvements in the specifics of it. So for one thing, this is, we're talking about a pseudo gene that exists, not a, not a gene that we haven't been able to find. And for another thing, the advantage doesn't have to come from intermittent starvation necessarily, but only from the reduced ability of fructose and glucose, because uh, it turns out that if you eat a enough glucose, you'll actually start making fructose endogenously. So let's talk about the relationship between fructose, uric acid, and obesity. It's been shown that fructose has a unique um, ability to raise uric acid compared to low fructose. And in fact, that source of uric acid has been so well recognized now that this author, or these authors put it in terms of the old view and the new view, where the old view said, well, so much, only so much of your serum uric acid can come from diet, because um, the rest of it's all endogenous. And then later we realized, oh, even that endogenous part can be drastically affected by diet. So Johnson and his group with the thrifty gene or a thrifty pseudogene hypothesis, have what they call the fat switch. And it has to do with AMP, which comes from use of ATP. So when you, your AMP uh, pool gets really high, there are two uh, really important pathways that AMP can go into. And one of them leads to through AMPD to fat accumulation and has also this effect of raising uric acid. And the other one is through AMPK, which actually does the opposite and leads to fat utilization. And so their great insight is that fructose metabolism results in a, a huge uh, influx of AMP. And not only that, it upregulates the AMPD pathway, which can dominate over the AMPK and create more fat accumulation. And even further than that, uh, some of their research suggests that the uric acid itself can then feed back into upregulating AMPD, so you're in this big fat accumulation cycle. 
And another cool thing about their theory is that they also incorporate the vitamin C loss into their theory because it turns out that vitamin C, at least partially, has been shown to decrease or mitigate that effect of fructose on fat storage. And they note that riper fruits have more fructose and less vitamin C. And vitamin C um, stimulates urate excretion, so it lowers it. And they also note that in synthesizers, uh, if, you eat, if they eat fructose, their synthesis of vitamin C goes down. So all of these um, suggest that even vitamin C might have been an early attempt to raise uric acid. So let's compare those then quickly. So the, the advantage of the thrifty pseudogene hypothesis is it doesn't necessarily have to involve famines because it can just involve um, availability of fructo fructose and glucose, which they did show happened in the time period involved. And so they're saying it would be advantageous to fatten easily from that. And so we developed these pseudogenes that help us be more sensitive to fructose. And we now no longer have that low fructose environment, and therefore we are obese. I, one thing I really like about it is it turns the idea from something about you're just eating too much to the quality of the food that you're actually eating. But we're still left with a possible interpretation, right, that high uric acid could be an advantage if you're in that low, low fructose environment and a disadvantage now when we're in a high fructose environment. Um, and maybe, maybe it's actually just a marker for metabolic syndrome. Um, one thing I really hoped to do for this talk but didn't have time to do was to do some analysis where you would adjust for some um, data and see if reducing uric acid, or sorry, uh, adjusting for metabolic syndrome would then show some kind of positive effect, but I didn't have time to do that. Someone did, some, did something similar uh, with cognitive uh, defects, or not defects, but um, diminishment of function in old age and dementia. They adjusted for CVD risk, which is metabolic syndrome, right? And they found that when they take that away, there was some actual advantage at least in their data, for a decreased risk of dementia. So that's interesting. But we have to come back to this idea that uric acid itself seems to be uh, causing this AMPD dominance. And, and in fact, that group suggests or claims, basically, that this should be causal of metabolic syndrome. And that I don't really have time to go through all of it, but um, this was an in vitro experiment where they had uh, cells that were starving, uh, regular and starving, and with uric acid or not, and they showed that the starvation effect of upping AMPK and reducing triglycerides and upping beta-hydroxybutyrate was abolished basically by adding uric acid. So that's, that seems really bad. Um, but this doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at the research of uric acid and ketosis. So it's long been known that at the beginning of a ketogenic diet or when you're fasting, serum uric acid goes way up as a consequence of the clearance going way down. And in this same year, several papers were published on this topic, and I chose this one because it has a neat experiment and pretty graphs. Um, they showed, well, they first of all noticed that the onset of that high uric acid and the reduced clearance is the same as the ketones go going up high. And then they showed that an infusion of beta-hydroxybutyrate will also reduce the uric acid clearance. And so this was the beginning of, the, of our understanding that they compete for uh, reabsorption and clearance in, in the kidney. And I, I'll just touch on this very briefly. You should know that a ketogenic diet, that only happens at the beginning. It actually uh, writes itself after keto adaptation. So this was a reanalysis of some uh, Atkins dieters. And if you look at the results after six months, you can see that people who had low or at, at borderline high uric acid, it's the same as baseline after six months although there's a positive or beneficial effect for people who had hyperuricemia, it actually came down. So in the long run, it's good for hyperuricemia, so in case you were wondering about that. Um, but if we look at this again, here we're seeing a big rise in serum uric acid. If this abolished the ability of AMPK to 
be dominant and do lipolysis, that we would just die from fasting, right? Obviously, in, no matter what's happening in vitro, we're definitely becoming AMPK PK dominant during fasting. One theory that came out um, in a paper this year was that it has to do with glycogen stores, and what they're trying to show in this diagram is that if you have low glycogen stores, then fructose gets shunted into glycogen synthesis. And it's even been suggested that that's good for athletes. Um, but if your glycogen stores are topped up, then only then is the fructose going to go down the fat synthesis pathway. OK, so finally, let's look at this from a cross-species perspective. It turns out there's another set of animals that don't have uricase, uh, a few, but birds is one of them. Um, and they have very high uric acid. Uh, for example, here's a peregrine falcon. In this experiment, their baseline level of uric acid is comparable to humans, right? It's at the high end. It's already 6.5 milligrams per deciliter. After eating a meal of meat, which they normally do, <laughs> uh, it went way up to like astronomical kind of levels. And there's no gout normally in birds of prey. The other really interesting thing about them is that in some cases, they are also double knockouts. So it's not everybody. They've had the uric acid, um, uricase mutation for a very long time, but some of them in multiple independent lines <laughs> also have a vitamin C knockout. And that includes um, migrating birds. Uh, forgive me for reading something, but I think this is a beautiful quote. The metaphor of marathon running is inadequate to fully capture the magnitude of long-distance migratory flight of birds. In some respects, a journey to the moon seems more appropriate. Birds have no access to supplementary water or nutrition during a multi-day flight, and they must carefully budget their body fat and protein stores to provide both fuel and life support. So in other words, when birds are migrating, they are fasting. They are the ultimate cyclic ketogenic athletes. And in fact, they are ketogenic when they do this. Uh, here's an example of some post-exercise ketosis in birds. The levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate are pretty high. You might not think it's very high, because if you think about a human in a similar situation, that would also probably be that level. But I've looked at ketosis in a variety of different species, and I've never seen that level in humans, uh, in any, any species other than humans and birds. Uh, granted, I haven't looked at everything. But for, for example, if you take dogs who do have uricase, um, if you put them in a similar context, you would expect about a quarter of that level. And they also have high uric acid. These are in unfamiliar, perhaps, units, but we're talking uh, on the low side, so, uh, about 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, and on the high side, 11.5. And the, the authors here were trying to distinguish between different species. And so they did this uh, principal components analysis saying that there is a negative correlation. Basically, some species of birds rely more on uh, ketogenesis, and some rely more on gluconeogenesis. And that, that kind of makes sense. So the fatter birds are using more lipolysis. And um, that shows up in uric acid, because that's a result of proteolysis. So what are some different sources of high uric acid? There are uh, the vegan situation, which I speculate might be from excess GNG due to amino acid deficiencies. Diabetes, we know, is a dysregulation that involves excess GNG. So maybe that whole metabolic syndrome uh, relationship comes down to uh, burning your muscles inappropriately. We have tissue damage. We have exogenous sources of purines that get broken down. And then there's only, there's only one thing that I know of that has to do with the excretion side, and that's that early stage ketosis where you have the trans, shared transporters. So I'm going I'm to say something that's purely speculative. Um, I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, wait a second. They're sharing transporters for excretion, and we, so we know that when there's suddenly a high influx of, of ketone bodies, the uric acid goes up. But what if... What if the benefit of high uric acid was to enable higher ketosis? What if the reason that birds and people have so much higher levels of ketosis is actually because they happen to have high uric acid and that keeps the ketones in circulations? Um, so it's just a very preliminary hypothesis. But when you look at this, 
figure, it's very suggestive because you have, you see the uric acid shooting up in the blood and this, the ketones shooting up in the blood and the uric acid clearance going down and it, it kind of um, suggests that maybe the clearance of uh, ketones is also similarly impaired in this period. So if, if uric acid levels lend some benefit and if the largest difference between our closest primate relatives and us comes from our leaving this hindgut fermenting diet to a diet that's basically hyper carnivorous, very high meat eating, so high that some scientists don't know what to make of our isotope levels of animal protein. Um, you, would, you would think that eating a lot of meat would already raise our uric acid levels so much that you, the, you would almost think the opposite thing would happen. We would lower our ability to retain uric acid to compensate for that, but that hasn't happened. So maybe it's possible that um, the high uric acid that we had boosted our ability to use a ketogenic metabolism on our high meat, low fructose diet. And anyway, that's, that's all sheer speculation, and I um, thank you for letting me say it. Um, but even if we don't know what the real advantage is, I'm not particularly convinced that the fattening effect is the whole story because we still have all those problems with fat uh, being fat not necessarily helping with reproduction. Um, and we still, I think that the question is still open. If fructose and glucose intake is low and glycogen stores are regularly depleted, be that through exercise, through intermittent fasting, or through uh, periodic ketogenic dieting, is uric acid still a risk factor for metabolic syndrome in some kind of a trade-off manner, or is higher uric acid strictly a win? And I, I'm really enthusiastic to find out if we can find more experiments that will lead to better understanding. So thank you. One thing that occurs to me uh, that's not incompatible with, with what you're suggesting about uh, ketosis is, uh, um, I know that urea is, which is not the same as uric acid, but is uh, used in the osmotic gradients of the kidneys and uh, endurance hunting in humans and migratory birds, for example, there's water conservation is really important and I'm wondering if our high levels of uric acid and tight regulation of, your, of uric acid might be a water conservation mechanism. Oh, I love that idea. I, I have this suspicion, and again, this is speculation, that we drink a lot more water than um, we normally would have, and that we probably had a, a different kind of water and salt balance than we, than we used to. Um, certainly, that's, that's a big argument in the bird situation with uric acid. It's because of the water solubility and there's also something related to having to do excretion while you're still in an egg, um, which wouldn't obviously apply to us. Uh, that's a really neat suggestion. Thank you. As a follow-up on that, do you have any thoughts about uh, salt on a carnivore diet? <laughs> uh, yes, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I'm not sure how much sense they make, but... One thing that I've noticed is that a lot of long-term carnivore dieters have spontaneously reduced their salt intake, and so I've been thinking a lot about why that might happen. And um, I, I'm not sure if it has to do with, um, with again, water balance. Uh, if you, you know, in the early days of ketogenic diets for epilepsy, one of the things that they did particularly was reduce restrict water intake, and that, that had a, a beneficial effect on, on sodium. And so if, if we're eating less or if we're relying more maybe on metabolic water from, from fat and, and even protein, that might have an effect. Another thing that I learned recently is that <laughs> if you look at some salt lick behavior in certain herbivores, they will go for salt much more after they've eaten a lot of plants. And the idea that the researchers who found this came up with is that 
uh, detoxifying the plant compounds actually takes a lot of sodium. And so it's possible that actually eating less plants requires less sodium. But I don't know. I'm making that all up. In your, uh, in your research about this, did you come across anything, and perhaps I missed it at the beginning of your presentation, that could, anything that would give insight into the mechanisms of gout independent of uric acid or, because it, it seems that this, it, it seems clear that in some situations, high uric acid level may be beneficial, and uh, may even serve an antioxidant role, or it's competing with BHB, things like this. It seems that the, the equation for gout is more complex than just the elevated uric acid like I learned in medical school. So any thoughts about what could be the other piece of that equation? It's high uric acid plus oxidative stress or something else? Well, so gout requires that the urate actually crystallizes. And once you've got a crystal, then that, um, if, it's not, if it doesn't dissolve again right away, it, can, it starts to build on itself. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem is that um, any changes in, in uric acid level up or down, so if you get medication for uh, hyperuricemia, uh, that can actually trigger a flare. And I think that might have to do with crystals um, just uh, coming out again because, the, because of the levels evening out. So now there's more room for uric acid and crystals come out, but they're already crystals, so then it causes another... Uh, but in terms of like what you could do dietarily, there's, um, you know, in terms of stones in the kidneys, which have a related um, kind of problem, you can try to uh, alkalinize your urine and that will help prevent it. But I really don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's because it's not known or if I just couldn't find it. I've hap I happen to have done research on that. And uh, what got me interested is long-term fasting, your uric acid goes very high. But gout patients, when they're long-term fasting, even though their uric acid goes very high, all their symptoms disappear. Well, it turns out that you have to have uh, another component with uric acid to create gout. And probably the most common one is high blood sugar, okay? The other, th which disappears, of course, when you long-term fast. Right. And the other thing is uh, high iron. You have to have, so if you don't have either high iron or high blood sugar, uh, you don't get gout if you have high uric acid. Fascinating, thank you. Great, Amber, thank you so much. Thank you.